look and study the Word of God together with you. Before we begin, as usual, let us worship uh, before our Maker and Creator. Today we are looking at uh, the last part of Daniel chapter 11. At long last, we are going through Daniel 11 and we'll be looking at uh, Daniel 12, just 13 verses. Uh, because we are not looking at the length of the chapter per se, but what is contained in each verse. I can even tell you right now that we'll spend some time looking at uh, verse 1, verse 2, up to verse 4. That's where we'll spend most of the time. And then we, after that, it's going to be an easy sale in Daniel 12. Without further ado, let us begin uh, today's study. I've entitled this one, Repency Unabated. That means we are continuing from that king, remember, who was rampant and was saying that rampancy is still going unabated, even at the closing scenes of this chapter. Before we we go any further this time, I thought it is good that we revise, relook, or revisit the schools of thought, because they are going to be playing a major role in today's study, as they, it has been all along, but lest we have forgotten about them. We spoke in this series about the, the futurists, the preterists, and the historicists as methods. Now, a little bit of a history around these schools of thought. Around the 16th century, Protestants' interpretations of Daniel and Revelation in particular they shook the world of the Roman Catholic Church. How? They were reading these books and the prophecies were pointing directly to the Pope. And do you think the Catholics would love that? I don't think so either. So they didn't like that. And in response, through their theological wing, which is called the Jesuits, they developed other two Bible interpretation methods or, or schools of thought. Which were those? These were the futurists and the preterist methods. Because the Protestant uh, 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 expositors were using the historicist method, that means they were looking at history to say what has happened, who did what. And so they wanted to confuse people, so they came up with these two uh, extra schools of, th of thought. This was a move. This move served to deflect the accusing finger of prophecy that was pointing directly at the Pope, to de deflect it away now from the Pope. Now, Let's look at the Preterists. The Preterist school, it comes from the, uh, the Latin word Preter, which means past. So Preterists then, you understand, they are looking at the past. They say everything in, the, in, in, in Daniel and in, in Revelation happened in the past. So there is no more need we're now living in a new dispensation of Christ. So Christ has come, so all of these prophecies that were there are now fulfilled, they're done away with. That's the preterist. So eventually the Protestants, because we like people who are educated, we like professors and doctors in the, in the law, in the Bible, school of thought, theologians, Great theologians, we like them so much, we listen to them so much. Then the Protestant world bought into this one uh, around about uh, the 18th century. So that became a standard view of the liberal Protestantism. 
the, without further noting where it came from. How I wish they had studied where it came from, but they did not. Let's continue. So for preterists to study history, they look at the historical critical scholarship and place the composition of Daniel and the, to the second part of the second century AD. It ended there around year 200. After that, no, there's no prophet that is pointing a finger at anybody, especially at, at, at Rome. So they see most, if not all, prophecies of Daniel reflecting the person at the times of Antiochus Epiphanes IV, who was the Seleucid king of Syria. So when you open any uh, a Bible, uh, uh, something that, that is going to tell you uh, this one refers to Antiochus Epiphanes, as we'll be looking at them from here, know now where it comes from. That's the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm giving you this one today. For this school of thought, the book of Revelation is restricted to the first century era only. That is now the book of Revelation. No, no nothing beyond that. So Rome shrewdly, I say, shrewdly knew that a change in the method of interpretation would lead inevitably to a change in conclusions and thus deflect the fingers away from Rome. Let's look at the Futurism now. Futurism is a Christian uh, eschatological view that interprets portions of the book of Revelation, the book of, Revel of Ezekiel and the book of Daniel to a future events in a literal sense. So apocalyptic uh, global context to them, uh, it's something that will happen uh, at the end of the time. That's when you'll find the seven churches that J John was referring to in the seven time. The time of wrath is way time when Christ is about to come. Others are even confuse it with the, the rapture. All of those are methods that were employed by Rome. And we as Christians are doing a great job for the, for the uh, uh, Romans in particular, because we defend these as ours without checking who came with, uh, with these and for what purpose. We'll find people defending the rapture, defending all of, all of these wrong things, defending them because they don't go to the history, the source where it came from. And as I've said, these include the rapture theory, the pre- and post-tribulation theory, theories, among the others. According to Fischism, the 70 weeks of Daniel will occur sometime in the future, culminating in just seven years or three and a half uh, years, uh, depending on the denomination uh, of tribulation. Others say tribulation will take seven years, others they say it's three and a half years, others they even go to the extent of saying seven weeks. Those, my friends, are thoroughly confused. That means they drank real good out of the wine of Babylon. Now let's come to the historicist method. I did say something about it in the, uh, at the beginning, but let's talk about it even now. So this method accepts the assumption that the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation in particular are intended to unfold, intended to, and, uh, to find a fulfillment in historical time. So you look into the history and see how these uh, prophecies were unfolding up to a time then you look into even though other futurists, futurists now, they don't even look to a future. Uh, no, they only say we, are, we deal with history. That's why you'll find others who are futurists, claiming to be futurists, they will be looking at 
in the book of Revelation, the ceiling, for example, and looking at it as something that has happened or that something that is, yeah, something that has happened, know that they have got just a sip in the wine of Babylon. That's about the schools of, of thought. I'll be referring to them in a little while as you go on. But let's recap on uh, our part seven. You remember there we said, we read in, uh, in verse 39 where we said, he will attack the mightiest forces with the help of a foreign god, small letter G, and will greatly honor those who acknowledge him he will make them rulers over many people and will distribute the land at a price. Remember that? That is what the verse 39 says. Pardon my spelling there. We are said that the mightiest for, uh, fortresses here is Christianity, unlike those who are doing the Christianity uh, method are saying that, uh, uh, that applied to Judah. To Israel, Jerusalem only. We assert that these, these uh, fortified uh, cities or fortresses are, is Christianity here, which he is going to attack. And in today's uh, portion, you will particularly see these fortresses, how they were being attacked. Yes, sublimely, of course, but they were going to be attacked. In our assertion, if our assertion is correct, then it was Christianity that was under attack by this king, noting that behind his rulership was Satan. Don't worry for now. We will show you our stance on this one as we, as we look or compare and read in Revelation, especially on Revelation chapter 13, which most people dread and we love it so much here. So we also note the mysterious vision of Constantine I, where uh, it is said that he, he was troubled trying to uh, uh, pray to a God who wanted a God who was going to assure him that he was going to win in the battle that he was, going to, uh, was undertaking. And these gods, of his did not respond to him until he dreamt at night uh, of a God who told him that on this sign you will conquer. And so he made a, a sign of a cross and he carried that sign and indeed he did conquer his enemies and hence you see everybody jingling the, the cross on their nets, on their ears, uh, on the, in their cars all the, 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 the churches now have got pictures of the crosses and things like that. It all stems from Constantine. We also noted further that it was that vision that led to the conversion of, uh, 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 of, of, of him and uh, it also led to the uh, stoppage of uh, Christian persecution and it also opened the floodgates to a lot of uh, compromise in so far as Christian faith is concerned. Let's pass there. Don't want to waste so, so much, spend so much time on, on it. Now, today we are looking at verse 40. Let us read verse 40. I did ask you, friends, to read verse 40. I wonder if you did. And even if you didn't uh, uh, get time, then. Read it with me as I'll be noting a few things. Then you can see what you missed. Verse 40 says, At the time of the end. When? At the time of the end. Not in another time. What will happen at the time of the end? The king of the south will engage him in battle. The king of the south will engage him at the battle, and the king of the north will storm out against him with chariots and cavalry and a great fleet of ships. Let's continue. He will invade many countries and sweep through them 
like a flower. Let me do state that for quite some time we are going to consider we are going to spend a considerable amount of time looking at this verse because as I looked through, as I read through and then tried to read what the other commentators and expositors are saying, I found that that they were missing something out of this verse. Did you get what they are missing? They left out the him and the he. They mistaken the he and the him, which is a personal pronoun of somebody, for another king. And they didn't follow the angel correctly there. Let's look at uh, those uh, alternative, as I'm saying, uh, look at these uh, four interpretations of Revelation now. Look, there is, there, there is that one, the preterism, yes. There is historicism, yes. There is idealism, that is the third one. There are many of these methods that have of, uh, since uh, come up. If just grammar, many of them. And many of them, they, have, they are doing a good job of confusing you so that you get deceived and are lost at the end. That's their own. That's why I put it here. But let's go on. I'll be referring to these as I read. I'm going to keep this screen on here for quite some time. So remember we've been referred to in verse 35, verse 35, or verse 36. We have been referred to that verse. Uriah Smith limits this conflict to historicist method, whereas we see a bit of future, futurism in there. So we're saying we should be able to use this quite flexibly and see that this, we can get uh, uh, this one from historicist and this one is best interpreted from using the futurist uh, method or school of thought here, as we're doing with our best friend and best commentator, Uriah Smith. We are saying, no, here he, we believe he should have applied the futurist approach rather than the historicist. But we, we understand his time era. We understand that we are not against that one. So we want to distinguish between the after some years, as in Daniel 11 verses 6 and verse 8, and from, uh, uh, from the, the time of the end, as in Daniel 11 verse 14. To us, there's a distinction between those two. What are the two that I'm talking about now? I said we are distinguishing between uh, uh, the time when the, the angel would say, after some years, and there was a time when the, the angel would say, at the time of the end. To us, these two terms are not synonymous. They don't mean the same thing at all. That's why we want to, we are quoting that one from there. And looking at Ellicott, ah, uh, my favorite co commentator, Ellicott. He's still stuck on Antiochus the Fourth Epiphanes. Remember, that is preterism. We have argued in part seven why we do not believe that Antiochus IV Epiphanes should be even mentioned in this part of the, of the prophecy. But he's stuck. Looking at another good commentator, pulpit commentary, this one, they're good in their own right. They say, Although uh, 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 the various, a variety of versions are, are being used on this verse, uh, but they do not agree with, uh, with this verse in the actual end, then what it means by the actual end. Let me put it this way. Although it looked, this pulpit commentary looked at a variety of versions on this verse, but it does not agree but we do not agree that this verse refers to the actual time of the end. Neither does this pulpit commentary, which we like. It is possible that the writer says pulpit commentary uh, to the writer, the entrance of the new era, the messianic time 
would coincide with the fall of Antiochus Epiphanes the Fourth. Aha! Preterism. They correctly assert, though, that Egypt, according to this verse, seems to be the aggressor. We, are, we credit them, them for that. And they correctly reject the suggestion that the two brothers who were Philometa uh, and Eurekes were at war with each other here shortly after the Syrian uh, invasion of 31 BCE. No, that wasn't the Syrian invasion, 31 BCE. That was the Battle of, of Actum. That is when Rome officially took over Egypt, which was the last remaining uh, uh, portion to the, of the Alexandrian kingdom. That way, Rome became the official world empire in that they had completely now overthrown the Greeks. The pre their predecessor, the Greeks. That should be clear, friends. That should be clear. We are still looking at the time of the end. We have not changed from that. So we're looking at this pulpit commentary at the moment. It's saying, we are saying, this commentary correctly denounces any war instigated by uh, Egypt for a long time after 31 BCE. We agree with them on that. Why? Because on our, on, on our research, we found that Egypt did not have any wars for a long time until 12 or 11, uh, yes, until, the, until the, the time of the Third Crusade. From the Third Crusade right up to Ottoman uh, uh, Ireland, and the British Protectorate was, the Kingdom of Egypt was, and the Republic of Egypt was, and finally of late, in the 19s, no, 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 not about, just 1967, uh, about the Egypt, uh, the United Arab Republic wars. We, are, we also noted in our research that Egypt is now better known as the United Arab Republic. So in our minds, when the angel says, the king of the south, it is no longer the same Egypt as it was during the time of the Archean Wars in 31 BCE. So we have been noted that Egypt now has some political relations with Syria, in that they both are Arab countries and they have forced some uh, re re relationship, even though they, 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 they did not succeed very well, but it is easy simply to fine-tune those relations of theirs and then continue uh, as normal. That's what we submit to you. Now, look at this. This is the map. This is what we mean when we say after 31 BCE, the map changed. Still, Egypt is still here where I highlighted in that rectangular block. And of late, Egypt and Syria, these two here, they forged some polit political or religious relations, though that one is still fragile. And Egypt is now a member of the Arab Republic there is another United Arab, United Arab uh, Emirates here. So all the Arab countries, they seem to be uniting, forging some federation or coalition of some sort. And to us, that must be in preparation for some prophetic something in the future. We are going to get there very, very so, always more time there. But on this map, just a few seconds, look at the, the, the light blue areas. All this light blue area here, that is the Seleucid Empire. So, all the countries marked in light blue then are what 
was then called the Seleucid Empire, the yellowish, this yellowish here, yellowish there, and yellowish there, and yellowish there, and yellowish there. That is uh, what is called was called the Southern Kingdom or the Kingdom of the South, which was Egypt. You we'll see that others are well on the northern part, but they belonged to the southern part uh, to, through imperialism. Won't spend much time on that one. Let's look at this one also, and if you are just taking a glance, this is the Roman Empire. It's called the Perium Roman Anum, or it is the Imperial Rome by the year 211. AD, that is in the second century AD. This is how Rome looked like. It looks like there were, as you can see, everything here is, a, is about Rome. Everything is about Rome. That confirms that they were a world empire. According to the Bible, they were the fourth beast. Remember the fourth beast had 10 horns, which you will see all of these countries here with their kings, but paying homage and paying taxes to Rome. That means there were kings, yes, but under Rome. So this must have prompted other expositors, we agree, to stick to the Alexandrian era rather than progressing with the kingdoms as we see on these two maps that I've showed you. And because the imperial Rome changed from political lies to a religious instead, then others switched from there and then they said no okay we're going to switch to atheism now and it will be atheism versus christianity as you will see as we process uh, progress in, in the process these friends of ours honorable commentators and expositors they lost track of who the south and the north is you will see that one let's continue in this map. I like the blogger here, and plan the slide, the, the blogger. The blogger here is Bill Salus. Bill Salus, his blog is a, a BibleProphecyBlog.com. He says, expositors believe that Daniel 11 verse 40 is about the regular king of the south and the regular king of the north, as we have read in this verse. And we agree with him there. We like him for that, for highlighting that. So according to the blogger here, Israel will defeat uh, Syria uh, in the fulfillment of this verse. Which verse? Verse 40. And verse 40, according to him, is not alone, is in, in line with uh, Psalm 83. All right? As I'm showing you there, Psalm 83. That Psalm is about, they say it's a prophetic psalm that uh, Israel is going to de defeat all of these uh, uh, countries and then uh, be a, a, a state, a power on its own. And we, such, we, we think that they are now attacking Gaza, even defying the commands and the instruction of the International uh, Criminal uh, Court ICJ, that they think it is time for Psalm 83 to be fulfilled, whereas that isn't any way going to happen. It doesn't happen their way, it will happen God's way. So we suspect we suspected that Israeli Hamas war, which is now spilling over to Jordan and other Arab countries, is being pursued in fulfillment of this prophecy they call prophecy of Psalm. 83. So when Israel has defeated or wiped out, according to the bloggers term there, wiped out Syria, then he asks the question, how can Syria still be the king of the north there? Which is a good question we, we contend. To us, Bill and other proponents of this theory are oblivious though of Daniel 11 verse 36. Like him as, as we are, but we are noting something that it seems to be oblivious with regard to Daniel 11, verse 36. The process that this king of the north uh, could then be uh, Gog 
or Mark Hawk, Hawk and Mark Hawk, as in uh, Ezekiel 38 verse 15 says the blogger, he is open to that process. And uh, we believe uh, to be, he also believes that this Gog and Magog of Ezekiel 38 verse 15 is Russia. Oh, I love him. He also putting in the Russians here. He is also open to the view that uh, I've said Ezekiel 38 verse 15 and, and uh, Psalm 83 might okay prior to this verse we're dealing with now, Daniel 11 verse 40. Is open to that idea, and we like your openness, sir. You see, the proponents of Daniel, when we say they are ob ob oblivious of, Di of Daniel 11 verse 36, it is because the angel made it abundantly clear that the king in Daniel 11 verse 36 will do as he pleases. Again, this king will be rampant in his rule until the wrath is completed. So he cannot change to be another person. Then he spoke about Gog and Magog, and we're now looking at the time of the wrath itself as part of, or as a portion of Daniel 11 verse 40. We're still dealing with verse 40 up now. So we could agree with the blogger if he says that Psalm 83 will be fulfilled just before the close of God's wrath. Even then, but we'll have a problem, and our problem will be Israel. Which Israel? Because Israel, according to the Bible then, that Israel is no more. So which Israel is this one? Israel was done away with in 70 AD. And Israel, they denied their Messiah, and then Christ spelled doom on them, and which doom was fulfilled in 780. So which Israel? Not unless you win the spiritual Israel, which accommodates you and I, who are commonly called Gentiles. So we are not sold to the idea that, that this verse, Daniel 11 verse 40, has anything to do with Israel, as the angel would have referred to them as your people, which he did in Daniel 11 verse 14. Now that he didn't say your people, then we are not sold to the idea that this means Israel. So Psalm 83 and all of that we are rejecting based on that, that the angel didn't say that. So the blocker also defines the hymn of verse 40 as the Antichrist, but he fails to lay sufficient or to persuade us enough to go along to agree with him on that one. And this is a prophecy map of that Ezekiel uh, 38 from verse 1 up to 18 and when all the Islamic nations will attack Israel north, south and east and something like that, which others they call Armageddon. And we'll talk about this one when we come to the book of Revelation. I just brought it in uh, for now so as to show you something that should trick, uh, trick your, your, your mind. Let's quickly move over. What is the time of the end? Remember, I asked that question and I've, we have not answered it well. What is the time of the end in this verse? What did the angel mean when he said, until the time of the end. Well, our friend P.G. Temple says, when Daniel says time of the end, he meant the end of time, of a prophetic time, or an end of a time prophecy. That one is not very clear to us. We couldn't accept it readily. Why? Because even though he says prophecy tells us about the papal Rome and what it will do, and that it is a 1,260-year time ending in 1798, according to him, the word push, meaning the waging war, and he gives examples of the text in Daniel 8 verse 4, but he accuses Egypt of atheism, quoting Pharaoh when he said, when Pharaoh said, who is that God that I should obey him? 
He says that is atheism, which we don't respectfully, we don't agree that is atheism. That is paganism. There is a difference to us between paganism and atheism. Our friend P.G. Temple links up with Uriah Smith, who, according, who, who according to his age, had before, uh, before him uh, accused the French of atheism when they denied the existence of God in the period between 1795 and 1815 AD. We understand Uriah Smith and his era. And there, there wasn't much of these counter theories at that time. We understand him. He used historicists because that was what was there available for him and to him. So to us, the time of the end is not and, uh, and was not French Revolution. Time of the end is not and was not French Revolution. We note the application of the historicist method uh, of the time of Uriah Smith, though. As we said, we understand his time, so he used the history that is what was available to him. Remember, Uriah Smith really believed that he was living at the time of the end by 1844. That's why you say we credit him for that. But KG Temple, as is living in our age, post-1844, we don't credit him for that. So according to KG Temple, the king of the north is the pope, and he links up the atheist power in conflict with Russia, in conflict here as Russia. That doesn't click very well in my mind. I'm sorry. I believe this part of the of his book or and, and this part of his exegesis was left ragged and it needs to be uh, smoothened. We agree with both Uriah Smith and P.G. Temple though that the king, we only agree with them when they say the king uh, of verse 36 is the Pope. When they say that, we agree with them 100%. When they deny that, then we don't agree with them there. So this way, according to verse 36, this king will be rampant until the wrath of God is completed. That's what we understand here. To us, this is the time of the end not the end, not the time of prophecy, but the time of the end, as the angel said it is. Who is this king? Who is he in verse 40? We're still on verse 40. We've spent such a considerable amount of time, of course. Let's look at the parties that are involved in verse 40. We are saying here, Yes, we agree with Uriah Smith and P.G. Temple that the king in question here in verse 36 is the Pope. All right? We, 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 however, do not agree that he is the king of the north here. We don't buy that. Why don't we buy that? It is because if you look at the verse here on your left, we have highlighted there some personal pronouns as found in the verse. The him, him, and the him. Also, the them, there. We've highlighted those. As we have highlighted the, the, those, we contend that this pronoun, or these pronouns, have been used to identify the subject as from verse 36. The subject has never changed we are saying, as from verse 36, they introduced the king and then they referred to that king as he and him. Verse 37, he. Verse 38, he. Verse 39, he and him. And verse 40, they also say he. When they, when they introduce a new player, <coughs> They said, the angel said, the king of the south. So that we do not confuse this new player with the subject in this verse. 
And when he introduces another player, he specifies, and the king of the north will against him. That is clear as we read. The latter part of verse 40 confirms what the angel had said at the beginning of verse 36, that he will do as he pleases. What is the latter part of verse 40 as we conclude this chapter with this verse? Well, the latter part of verse 40 said, he will invade many countries and sweep through them like a flood. So we are saying this part confirms what the angel said in the, in the beginning part of verse 36, that the king will do as he pleases. Remember the time of wrath, we did deal with that one in our part 7, so we are not going to waste time on it here anymore. Well, as we note uh, what makes Uriah Smith and P.G. Temple to, to push for 1798 uh, AD, but in our reading of the verse, I'm sorry, we do not find any su suggestion, anything that suggests uh, to atheism here. Nothing that points to atheism we, we, we do find here. We would accept, though, if they were referring to the crusade wars, although we would have a problem in that Egypt only joined the crusade wars from the third crusade onwards. So they didn't initiate the crusade wars and they did not start in Egypt. They were not initiated by Egypt. Though you might say according to history, they, they, they were part of uh, the Muslim Islamic people, but they were not Egyptian. Egypt had, had no ties with them at that time. Let's continue now <clears throat> and look at the, we're still looking at saying, who is the king of verse 40? And we have looked at the parties involved in verse 40, and we've paraphrased the, the verse 40 for you, and now we're looking at the king of the south, and the king of the north, who are these? Let's get on to it. The idea of the Crusades we would support in that according to the Wikipedia, Pope Evan II proclaimed the first expedition at the Council of Clement. He encouraged military support for President uh, Emperor Alexios I, Comenos, and called for an armed pilgrimage to Jerusalem, not to Egypt, but to Jerusalem, because there were people who were pilgrims who had uh, coming from the Western Europe who were visiting Jerusalem to look at the Holy Land, visiting the tomb of, uh, of, of Jesus, uh, the Galilee, and the places where Jesus, tracing the steps of Jesus there, which is a money-making scheme for uh, the current Israeli government. Those were hijacked and they were terrorized by the, the, uh, some, some Islamic people there, and then the king or the pope ordered that those citizens who were citizens of uh, the Byzantine Empire that it, it dispersed the, the, the armies to go and uh, assist in that regard. And what happened? Across all social strata in Western Europe, and there was an enthusiastic response. Why enthusiastic response? Because the Pope had spoken. And the Pope had spoken promised them financial, he had, gains, he had promised them forgiveness of their sins, he had promised them uh, gaining the land, he, if, they, if they conquer that land, they, they, they'll, they'll take it at, at a very, very low cost, as verse says, distributing the land at a, a cost. The participants came from all over Europe, 
and had a variety of motivations, including, among others, religious salvation, satisfying feudal obligations, uh, opportunities for renown and economic uh, or political advantage, and land where it was captured. So that was a gold. They were striking gold. It was their gold rush. So this fits perfectly with Daniel 11, verse 39. And we think that a reversal of this religious conflict, a redone of this religious uh, uh, something, will take place very, very soon. Will take place any time from now. We believe that. That's our belief. We're entitled to it, please. So we think that that would happen notwithstanding the fact that the Pope is unifying now all religious formations under one world order and one world religion of the new world order. We believe that will still take place. We believe. So it is nobody said that history repeats itself. Hence, we are basing our belief that it happened in the past, so will it happen again. Those were the techies who attacked people from Turkey. And then you can say they are, they are all the north. Verse 41. We believe that religious pilgrimages in one world order government might spark resistance again. The many countries here we submit would be having Islamic uh, diehards who will not accept the new world order and start a rebellion. Mm -hmm. If we are correct, get me where I said, if we are correct, then that the provocation shall uh, be on account of religious affiliations. That, of course, would affect Jerusalem. And we're saying, okay, that is us. We are not told exactly why Ammon, Moab, and Edom will escape and attack that time. We are not told. But we tried to get the views of other Bible expositors, like studylight.org, who suggest that these and other Arabians or Arab countries, right, they have never been able to subdue. They still occupy the desert and receive a yearly a pension of 40,000 crowns of gold from the Ottoman emperors. Why? Just to permit the uh, caravans uh, with the pilgrimages for Mecca to have a free passage there. Of course, we don't buy this. Of course, we don't buy it. We don't think that we don't buy it. Our friend Peter Debra says, he suggests that since these countries are Arab, and practice Islam as their religion, so they will not be affected by the coming Sunday laws. That's what he says. Another commentator, the BibleHub.com, says, these tribes were spared because they readily complied with the king's command and even joined the forces against the Jews. So he thinks the Jews will be uh, the focus here. We don't think so. Again, Pidge's temple says here, Ammon, Moab, and Edom are used as symbols here. They symbolize those who did not know about God's truth until very, very late that time when it is proclaimed as he believes that there will be an, an, an announcement that now this is Sunday law. Anyone who breaks, who does any work on this day being Sunday, 
will be prosecuted and persecuted. And those who will convert at that time and say, we didn't know, and then they ask, that's what you mean. That's what he says. So he says, these will respond to a loud cry of the uh, three angels' message, and then uh, uh, turn and observe God's ten commandments, which are an issue at that time. He knows uh, that the word escape in this verse is different from the escape word that is used uh, insofar as Egypt is concerned in verse 41. I'm not going to read it due to time. We are not told by the angel why these will escape. So all what I've given you so far is just speculation because the angel did not say, and we are, we are said to you that this will take place in the future. That's why we are not looking for history. Verse 42, verse 42, I'm taking it where it says, he will extend his power over many countries. Egypt will not escape. That part, I've, I've even alluded to that uh, previously. So we agree here with P.G. Temple when he says this refers to the United Nations. Remember when I spoke about uh, the, the image of the beast in Revelation 13? I'll still, still uh, refer to that one when you come to that one. Most expositors, they downplay the role of the United Nations there to their own peril or detriment. He further says that Egypt is used here in prophecy to mean two things. One, the secular world at large, and two, atheism in, in particular. To me, that is one and the same thing. But he says they are true and distinct. We respect his view. So according to him this way, this king will control both the atheists and the world in general. I would have understood if he says this way, the, the king, this king will control both the the, 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 the religious sector of the, of the world and the non-religious sectors of the world. I would have understood better. So, to those who think that because they are not religious in any way and they have very little to do or interest on religious matters, P.G. Temple says, we are assured here that he is going to control all countries of the world, not just religious people, but all. Verse 43, we are continuing. The prophecy also said that he will, uh, he will gain control of the treasures of gold and silver and all the riches of Egypt. That the prophecy did indeed say. Peter Temple says, this verse is full of symbolic meaning when you look at the power over the treasures, that's symbolic. Maybe it's correct. Let's hear him further there. He says this shows that the control of, the, of this despotic power will control the financial world, the economic sanctions to, level, uh, to a level never before possible. We could buy that. This way, the angel is proclaiming that uh, is uh, uh, that both the rich and the poor of the earth will be going to be subjected to this king indiscriminately. That the prophecy of Revelation 13 does say, and you agree with him there, that all of those, all the despair, uh, that all everybody is going to be affected, that will only spell doom to God's true followers. I will not get in there because many will fall, the angel said, but there's something I will explain in, Rev in the book of Revelation in that regard. Verse 44. Let's read now from 
Another version that I've not used for a long time, the Theodosian uh, version, which is Septuagint, so that we can find a true meaning of this verse because we found it to be quite difficult. It says, rumors and disturbances out of the east and from the north shall trouble him and he shall come in much wrath to destroy many. That's what the Theodosian uh, says. P.G. Temple, he links this verse with Revelation 7 verses 1 and 2 about the sealing of God's people, God's faithful people on their foreheads. Why does he link? He says the angel rose from the east. So he says uh, those people, a message will come from the east that will be saying uh, uh, there are people that are being sealed, there are people that are observing through God's commands and here that will enrage this king to war. Mm. You see to us, we're not buying that. Why? Because we do not believe that there will be an announcement that now God's people are being sealed everywhere, they are queuing somewhere, and they are now observing. No. People will continue to be who they are, doing what they do, they know best. And the angels who are not seen by human naked eyes will be doing their work of sealing us. Maybe he has just sealed me here. Who knows? I didn't see him. You didn't see me either. Verse 45. The tabernacle of his palaces, not of his places, but palace, not of his place. Page Temple again, we relied on him here. Look at that, that place there. Look at it. This one. You see all of these statues of lions step by step and somebody going up there. This is not just a temple because there's a king there. And, um, this is his place. Let's forget that one. And listen to our, our friend, Priest Jameson, who calls, uh, who, who, who says here what is a very, very subtle uh, symbol. What is that subtle sim symbol he says here? It is the tabernacle and his place. He notices that the palace is a residence of the king and is where the king is a king and he, he exerts his authority, the palace. And everybody looks to the palace for redemption, to the king in the palace. That's why the, uh, the, the Muslims, they pray towards Mecca and the Jews pray towards Jerusalem. I don't know where the Christians pray, or they, oh, they pray towards the cross, except for me. But just about that. So we agree with him when he says here, we see an indication of, the, of, the, of, of, of a church and a state power being combined. We agree with him in so far as that is concerned. And so, according to him, the king of the north takes a stand here. Remember, to him, the king of the north is the Pope. But let's check verse 45. He will preach his royal tents between the seas and between, uh, between the seas at the beautiful holy mountain. He will come to his end and no one will have him. He didn't say anything about the king of the north. That's where we differ with our friend. He says, though, the words plant his, tab his tabernacle of his place, of his palace in Hebrew, is equivalent or is tatamount. That's what the Rikadia said in Senso Meo's case. Tatamount. He says this is tatamount to uh, pitching up a tent for war in Hebrew. Well, we can't uh, argue with him there. So among these, to us, there will be those who study 
the Pope, let me repeat that one. He says, number one, expositors will get all confused when they keep looking to the literal land of Israel for something to be fulfilled uh, in these words, when it has a spiritual and a worldwide meaning. Let me repeat what he said for the last time. He says, expositors will get confused, all confused, when they keep on looking to the literal land of Israel for something to fulfill these words of this prophecy, when it has a spiritual and a worldwide meaning to it. And we're saying he's correct there to us. That includes those who are focusing on the Pope, following the Pope, whatever he does, Pope this today, Pope that tomorrow, neglecting the image of the beast. That is it, my friends. Until we meet next time.